Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper in this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, we need to talk coloring. I will be making an Easter card today and I will be using the Somebody Loves Me stamp set from Simon Says Stamp. I will be stamping the images in Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink because it is alcohol, mar alcohol marker friendly. I will be stamping the images on Nina Classic Crest Solar White 80 pound cardstock. I am using the bunny, the chick, and both eggs. I will stamp the eggs multiple times. One thing you will notice is that you'll see a picture of this little chick colored in orange, but you won't see me color it because I edited that out because I didn't like the color combination. So I re-stamped and recolored that cute little chicky. I'm using a mostly pastel Easter, obviously, color palette. Um, and then I'm making a card at the end. So I think that's all of the coloring. Let's go ahead and jump into our crime. Our journey today takes us to North Carolina. North Carolina was the first American territory that the English attempted to colonize. Sir Walter Raleigh, for whom the state capital is named, chartered two colonies to the North Carolina coast in the late 1580s, both ending in failure. The demise of the lost colony of Roanoke Island remains one of the greatest mysteries of American history. Then, from 1629 until 1712, the colonies of North and South Carolina were one unit. Under the terms of the North Carolina ben ben Benial Act, I probably butcher that, of 1712, North Carolina became a separate colony with its own assembly and council. In 1729, North Carolina became a royal English colony. Then, on November 21, 1789, the General Assembly, meeting in Fayetteville, ratified the United States Constitution, making North Carolina the 12th state. The process was not easy, however, considering that in 1788, the General Assembly actually declined to ratify the United States Constitution, suggesting many amendments and calling for a Bill of Rights. On November 16th of 1789, a second convention met to take the matter up again. The Constitution, with the addition of the Bill of Rights, was ratified five days into the convention. So thank you, North Carolina, for our Bill of Rights. North Carolina is the first state to have a successful flight of a mechanically propelled airline. Thanks to the Wright Brothers, or airplane, rather, thanks to the Wright Brothers, North Carolina is also home to the first Krispy Kreme donut and Pepsi. Thank you, North Carolina, for Pepsi. <laughs> North Carolina is also home to the first miniature golf course and is the place where Babe Ruth hit his first professional home run. The University of North Carolina was the first public university and Vicks Vapor Rub was first sold in Charlotte, North Carolina. Or was first sold in North Carolina, but in Charlotte, North Carolina, is where we find the home of the first family dollar location ever. Sorry about that. I did not punctuate myself properly. The Outer Banks, the coastal line of North Carolina, are nicknamed Graveyard of the Atlantic and is where the pirate Blackbeard eventually died due to rough storms. Even though the tallest lighthouse in the United States is located in the Outer Banks. And North Carolina is home to a story some call a tragedy. I will let you decide if it's really a tragedy. George Washington Carowin was born in Sequatter, North Carolina, on an unnamed day in an unnamed month of 1800. His parents were William and Anne Carowin. He was the third of their fourth, four children with older sisters Elizabeth and Manna and younger brother Green. Yes, that is his name, Green. Unfortunately, William died when George was only four, leaving the children to be raised by their now widowed mother. Amy was known to be a hard worker, very strict, and very religious. She was a staunch member of the old school Baptist church and was known for her strong will and even her violent temper. <laughs> 
Though George was well-schooled in scripture, he was more influenced by his mother's harsh methods, becoming at an early age a, quote, profane and callous individual, using his knowledge of the Bible to mock religion. One of his favorite hobbies growing up was to attend Baptist and Methodist sermons and then mock them for the crowds, you know, for his own friends, for crowds of his own friends. Yeah. Yeah. He's a peach. George eventually grew up and went on to marry Elizabeth Caro at the age of 21. Together, they moved to Goose Creek Island, living in close proximity to George's preacher brother, Green. Here, George spent a few years as a mildly successful farmer. At some point, though, George reportedly accused his brother, Green, of attempting to seduce Elizabeth. Angrily, he moved back to Hyde County. Seven years later, George would ask repentance for his sins and publicly convert to the Baptist church. I did not find any record of what happened to cause his change of heart. Like none of the sources that I used for this information um, talked about some major life event or near-death experience or nobody even said he got soft in his old age. He just, you know, Seven years after having a fallout with his brother, he asked for repentance. He repented of his sins and was and converted to the Baptist church. He was then baptized by Elder Enoch Brickhouse, who acknowledged his own hopes for George's future as a preacher. Okay, So, of course, George decided to become a preacher. He thrived in his role as a preacher, building churches in neighboring communities as well as taking over for minister of Goose Creek Island when his brother Green passed away. George's influence continued to grow for 20 years. He was um, in charge of all the old school Baptist churches in four counties and had baptized more than 500 people. That's a lot of baptizing. And although George refused any form of salary or payment for his services, He lived lavishly on Rose Bay Farm, was classified a rich man, and was the owner and enslaver of a number of people. And I only mention that because it is relevant later. Though a preacher of the gospel, George remained a man of violent temper and strong passions. Sadly, in 1839, his wife Elizabeth suddenly died from symptoms resembling arsenic poisoning. Just three weeks after her death, George married Mary Bell. Now there are two different theories about Mary. One source said that she was George and Elizabeth's housekeeper and another said she was living with them like as a boarder. Whatever the case, it was also noted that George wore the same suit to Elizabeth's funeral as he did to his wedding to Mary. Even with these types of questionable displays, the members of this community felt George was extremely virtuous and admirable. He was described as having boyish charm and spending, especially when spending large amounts of money on entertainment for his three sons. I should mention here that George's wives birthed 20 children and only three survived childhood sad. It should also be said that George was known to regularly beat his wife, sometimes knocking her down with clenched fists. And it was not exactly a secret that he continued to have mistresses on the side. One young woman named Polly Richards claimed that he actually was the father of his ch- of her child, and that led, from, led to his dismissal from the church. But again, he repented and made promises of of being a new, improved man and was reinstated to the church. The child, however, Polly's child, lived with his family and then mysteriously died at age three. George was also reportedly exceptionally hospitable. He allowed travelers and guests to stay at his home took in borders. Talk about an oxymoron 
He's a wife beaten nice guy? I don't even know how that even goes. However, there was one individual in particular who did not receive this um, exceptional hospitality that the Reverend George was so known for. And this was a man named Clement H. Lassiter. Now, Clement was a school teacher. And he was well known and, and renowned for being a good school teacher. In about 1852, Clement was boarding with George and his wife. He was known to be a quiet and reserved man, and he was well liked by both students and parents. One day, he actually saw George beating his wife over something that he deemed trivial and tried to intercede. George then turned his wrath on Clement, who pulled out a knife to defend himself. The fight went no further, but George kicked him out, told him he couldn't stay at the house anymore. George then accused Clement of being intimate with his wife, an allegation very similar to what he had previously accused his brother of, except in this case, he went so far as to have his wife testify before the magistrates that Clement had actually raped her. Now, this was so obviously a lie that the magistrate refused to act because they didn't want Mary to have to perjure herself. Clement then sued George for slander, seeking $2,000 in damages. George was enraged, and he told several of his neighbors that both men could not live in the area, and he believed that Clement ought to be shot. When Clement left George's house, he um, took up residence at a boarding home um, run by Dorset Mason. Now, according to an 1853 New York Times article, Clement had finished teaching in the school on Rose Bay in November. And on Monday, the 15th of November, he started out on foot with a carpet bag in his hand to go from Rose Bay out to the lake where he had engaged his next teaching position. Clement also reportedly told Dorset he was a little bit nervous to walk down the turnpike past George's house because of the animosity between the two men. However, he took up his carpet bag and walked down the road, making several stops along the way, conversing with the neighbors, and he talked as he walked toward the new school. However, Clement never reached his destination and was never seen alive again. A few days later, Clement's friends learned he was missing and fearing the worst began searching the woods on both sides of the turnpike between the boarding house and the new lake school. Saturday afternoon, so he, he left Monday, this is now Saturday, two men happened upon a mossy spot that was in a dense thicket and there was nothing super suspicious there, but there were a few clumps of dirt and um, a branch that seemed to be decaying. So beneath the grass, though, they found a shallow grave. And in that grave, guess who they found? You're right. It was the body of Clement Lassiter. And he was riddled with buckshot. The find was so lucky because it was um, not an obvious dig site because it was in this thicket, all these things. It was such a lucky find that it was reportedly attributed to the finger of Providence. Now news of the discovery traveled fast. And when George heard it, he reportedly had a conversation with his nephew. Now his nephew's name is Carolyn Sawyer. And he, George told Carolyn that he would actually give him ownership of his, quote, favorite slave, Seth, if Carolyn would say that George had been home with him all day on Monday. So obviously his nephew knows he was not home, and he is now trying to um, bribe this young man. There were some reports that stated that Carolyn Sawyer was not exactly um, upstanding, in fact, um, after George had this conversation with his nephew, he packed his bags and left North Carolina. And while he was gone, his nephew, according to one source, 
was kind of bragging about the money he was going to come into now that his um, uncle was gone. So anyways, George, 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 traveled by train and steamboat to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and lived there for several months under the name John Forbes. Get this, he worked as a traveling preacher. Um, just in case you're wondering, this is not how you stay incognito when you've killed somebody or when people think you've killed somebody. Just, just so you know. <laughs> George had given power of attorney to a friend back in Hyde, North Carolina, and instructed him to sell said property. Um, the friend had become convinced that he was the one guilty of murdering Clement, and so he refused to have anything to do with George. This necessitated George returning to North Carolina to dispose of the property himself. His plan was to hide out on Goose Creek Island. He still had friends there and some people who regarded him as their spiritual leader. And he was hoping to hide out there while he secretly arranged the sale of his um, farm, his property. He left the island in the dead of the night and went home to see his wife. Now, George's, again, quote, favorite slave, Seth, spotted him as he entered the house and immediately informed the neighbors. Eventually, news spread, and before George knew it, a crowd had assembled outside his home, and he was arrested. While awaiting trial, George sent some letters to some of his supporters. So, in one letter... He was asking his friends, his supporters, the people that still thought he was this good guy, to um, convince his nephew to leave town. And that if he did not leave town, um, the quote, to put aside the evidence by hook or by crook was written down in one article. And the implication was that if Carowin Sawyer did not leave town, he should be killed. Another letter George sent was um, he was trying to get a friend to find witnesses they could bribe, um, including an African-American man. And what he wanted was for these witnesses to... Um, perjure themselves in his behalf, and swear out complaints against the prosecution. His letters that he wrote from jail were intercepted by the authorities. So, you know, he's not the smartest of criminals. I'm just going to throw that out there. He's not a smart criminal. The letters that were intercepted by George or intercepted Okay, let me start that again. The letters that George wrote that were intercepted were used against him in court. There we go. Um, other than that, mostly what they had was um, circumstantial evidence, but a lot of it. There were a number of witnesses that testified about him saying that Clement should be shot, that they both could not live there. There were witnesses testifying that they had seen George go into the woods with a shotgun on that Monday. Um three different sizes of buckshot were found in Clement's body and that those same sizes of, of buckshot were still loaded in George's gun. The most damaging testimony, however, had to have been the testimony of Carolyn Sawyer, the nephew, when he testified that his uncle had tried to bribe him to lie about his whereabouts. He also testified that he had seen his uncle with the shotgun that day. Now, the defense challenged all of the testimony, because of course they do, right? They claimed that these witnesses were committing perjury willingly. They suggested that the murder hadn't even been committed on Monday. Like, how do you know he was killed on Monday? Nobody found him till Saturday, blah, 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 blah. Um, the biggest thing that they challenged was the nephew's testimony. Apparently, when the coroner's jury or the coroner's inquest was held, Sawyer testified of one thing and then after the charges were brought and his uncle went on trial he testified that he did in fact see his uncle carrying a gun on monday into the woods 
So there was some issue of credibility there. The judge at first was inclined to agree that with the defense that Sawyer or that the nephew's testimony was um, questionable. So at the close of um, statements, at, at the end of closing statements, the, the judge instructed the jury and initially he told them to disregard the contrary ne um, nature of Carolyn Sawyer's testimony. And then he sent the jury to um, deliberate. But then about half an hour later, he called them back into court. He called the jury back, the prosecution back, and the defense back. And he clarified his statement. And what he said was that the jury should use the nephew's testimony to determine his own, um, whether or not he was a good witness. I can't think of the right word. You know, that, that, that they shouldn't put it aside, even if they think that maybe he was not necessarily the most honest of individuals, if they thought that in that moment he was telling the truth, that they should use that, that testimony. He felt that he had overly cautioned them as to the nephew's testimony. So when George first heard the judge's instructions, he wholly believed he would be acquitted. But when the judge called them back in and told the jury to use their own judgment in relation to the, the nephew's testimony, George was convinced he would be convicted. So that night, as the jury deliberated, he began to realize his fate and asked that his wife and sons be granted the opportunity to stay the night in the jail leading up to his verdict. Um, I'm sorry. I love my husband. I'm not spending the night in jail for him. So anyway, um, according to most sources, George had made it clear to his wife as well as to fellow prisoners that he would not come back to jail and accept punishment of being hung if he was convicted of murder. Um, again, not exactly the smartest criminal in the jailhouse. Anyways, the next day, George was brought to court to hear the jury's verdict. So they did deliberate for a little while. It wasn't super fast, but it did only take them about a day. And they did, in fact, find him guilty. Um, once the, the verdict was read, the defense attorneys requested that the jury be polled. Pulled, P O L L E D, pulled. And each man on the jury, when asked, affirmed that they had voted guilty. So on November 30th, 1853, upon the jury's announcement of finding him guilty of the murder of Clement Lassiter, George took matters into his own hands. He, uh, well, he had kind of sort of stuck some contraband into jail. And as the judge discarded, discharged rather the jury, George reached into a shirt, pulled out a small single shot pistol and fired it at the prosecuting attorney, hitting him just above the heart. And then amid all of the confusion, he pulled another pistol. And in spite of the deputy's attempt to stop him, fired it into his own temple. Bleeding profusely, George fell to the floor and died soon after. The judge quickly left the bench. Everyone was shouting and running around the courtroom, and the prosecutor seemed to be the calmest person in the room. Anxiously, those still in the courtroom asked the prosecutor if he was hurt. He replied that he was, in fact, not hurt. The bullet had struck a locket that he wore under his clothes and had ricocheted away, tearing the stiff padding in his lapel. I know. Pick your chins up. We got more stories still. A later examination proved George's brain had been pierced from side to side and the bullet had lodged just between his left eye and he died instantly, perhaps as Clement had. It weirdly is also reported that after his face was cleaned off, he seemed quiet and peaceful. George was buried appropriately enough on a spot where Gallows had once stood near Buford's County Almhouse. Later, his relatives brought the body to Rose Bay, but neighbors protested against his burial there. They did not want him there dead or alive. 
Um, finally, he was buried in a grave at Juniper Bay, which is a few miles away from his house at um, Rose Bay. The end. Ah, just kidding. You know that's not the end. <laughs> In North Carolina, a slave was not permitted to testify in court against his master. But after the trial, George's, quote, favorite slave, Seth, told what he knew of the murder. Just before dark on that Monday night, George came to him and said that he had killed Clement and that they must go into the woods and bury the body. Seth, Seth claimed he reluctantly went with him. They hogtied the body, dragged it to the spot George had already selected. George then cut the turf away with a knife, and using sticks and their bare hands, they dug a shallow grave. They untied the body, put it in the grave, and replaced the turf. It seems Seth had been the one who turned George in after his return to Hyde. Obviously, when he notified the neighbors, he knew exactly what was going to happen. But it is also possible that his was the finger of providence that pointed the searchers to Clement's body. There is a Seth Carowin in the 17, or sorry, 1870 census for Hyde County, North Carolina, listed as black, born about 1820, with a wife, Hetty, and four children. Charlie, named for the murdered Charles Lasseter, maybe? Seth, Graham, and William. Based on the 1870 census, Seth would have been about 32 when the murder occurred. And just because they can and they wanted to add insult to injury following his death, George was accused of murder of his first wife and the murder of his second wife's suspected lover. Which is hilarious because he had a mistress or mistresses. However, these were never addressed as he was already dead. <laughs> Can you imagine throwing charges at somebody who's already dead? Okay, here is a picture of this cute little Easter card that I finished up, and there were also sketches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a sketch of George William Washington, sorry, George Washington Carowin's home, and this is a sketch of George himself. I know, crazy, isn't it? He doesn't look all that handsome, and yet, I don't know, he had the women and the people falling at his feet. I hope you enjoyed our story today. I have a couple of other videos here I think you might like. I have also added a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment below. Tragedy or comedy of errors? Give me a thumbs up and have a great day.